we are ready now to go on with our final featured speaker this evening, and that is Will Wright. Um, I guess Will Wright is probably most well known for his very influential and important work educating gamers about the Russian space program. <laughs> um, and I assume that uh, that will be the bulk of what he'll talk about today, but he may talk about some other stuff too. I think he might be involved in some other things as well. Um, but anyways, it is my great pleasure to invite Will Wright to the stage. Hi everybody, can you hear me okay? So I've been lately very interested in kind of our perception of the world and the way games and entertainment in general can kind of moderate that, you know, in interesting ways. I want to start actually though with a very kind of quick quiz here. How many of you can reliably kind of point out which one of these characters is Admiral Akbar? <laughs> okay, I'd say it's 70%-ish. Okay. All right, here's another test. How many of you in this audience can reliably kind of identify, of course that's him, Admiral Nimitz? <laughs> oh, that's easily less than 2%. <laughs> okay, that ratio is worse than I thought. Chester Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, World War II? Okay, it's this guy. <laughs> now you know. There's an important distinction between these two characters. <laughs> That it's interesting just kind of looking at the, uh, the ratio here, you know, and I think entertainment in some sense is more real to us than reality. Uh, Admiral Ackbar, of course, has a Wikipedia entry like everybody, as does Admiral Nimitz. And by almost all accounts, Admiral Nimitz was a much more successful admiral. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he basically won the war in the Pacific, you know, he kind of, you know, was battle midway critical. Uh, admiral Ackbar really, you know, just kind of falls into traps, right? So. <laughs> But yet, in some sense, Admiral Ackbar, I think, to all of us, is more real. You know, we feel like we know him. Now, this ratio here, and I think it's actually worse in this crowd. Uh, <laughs> I think in the first GDC, it would have been higher, because there would have been a lot more kind of students in military history. But, uh, you know, I think you can pick any two fictional characters and uh, real people, and you get kind of a similar ratio. I think kind of in our culture, we have this idea that we consume artificial experiences, whether they be play, story, toys, whatever. Um, before we have a lot of real experiences, that basically we ramp that down over time in our lifetime as we accumulate more and more real experiences. You know, I think that, you know, the real world, whether we're a kid or an old person, you know, we have two worlds really we inhabit now. You know, one's made of atoms, one's made of bits. Uh, I think if we kind of look across, you know, the different generations, we see a kind of a groundswell change here where the amount of focus and time and attention and reality that we actually ascribe to these things is actually, you know, almost even, you know, with the generations going up right now, the amount of time we spend on the web. Our view of the world is actually moderated through, you know, virtual experiences, remote experiences, et cetera. Uh, you just look at how much somebody's willing to pay for, like, you know, World of Warcraft character, and obviously people are, you know, ascribing value to these things, and it's very real to them in that sense. Now, I think in terms of our perception of the world around us, we can kind of think of different kind of bubbles of experience that come into us. You know, one is kind of directly through our senses. What do we directly experience? Uh, this is what I want to call like the personal kind of level of the world. Uh, next level out is really kind of people we know, places we go, or schools, work, et cetera, or community level uh, view of the world. Slightly more indirect. Uh, and then now from there, it's basically the rest of the world out there. And this is more experienced through media, you know, newspapers, television, et cetera, things we hear about, larger events in the world. And it's a much more indirect kind of experience we have. I think games have slowly been kind of working their way through these layers. You know, they really originally were about these kind of large epic things or historical things in the world. We were, you know, commanding generals, you know, fighting wars. Uh, then they became a little bit more closer to home. And nowadays they're very, very personal, you know, social networks and whatnot. Uh, starting with the world, just kind of looking at that viewpoint, you know, games have always, for me, had this really interesting ability to give us different perspectives uh, on the world around us. One of the most influential books for me as a kid was this book, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And, you know, roughly he talked in this book about how there were two different ways of thinking about a motorcycle. One is very analytic, you know, how do you troubleshoot a motorcycle? How do you decompose it? What's the taxonomy? What's the Aristotle view of a motorcycle? The other one is really, what's it feel like to ride a motorcycle? The wind in your hair, you know, going down a country road, which is very, very experiential, very zen-like. Uh, 
neither one of these views really is the correct view. The correct view is some conglomeration of many, many views like that. You know, you can take anything, and it's really the triangulation of many different viewpoints, I think, that give you a fully rounded perspective on what that thing is. And I think this is something that games have done extraordinarily for me as I play games. I kind of get different views of things. Um, I think these perspectives to me are actually more valuable than solutions, because usually when I hit a really hard problem, it's a matter of me just twisting that problem around and looking at it from five, 10, 20 different angles, and eventually one angle is the one where the solution just becomes crystal clear. Uh, if I'm looking at it from the wrong viewpoint, Chris Crawford kind of brought this point up a little bit earlier in the last session, but uh, and this, you know, for me, I found to be probably the most useful thing in my life when I'm dealing with hard problems. In some sense, you know, games give us different lenses that we can put on reality in the world around us. You know, I also have really enjoyed digital photography uh, for a similar reason. In some sense, for me, digital photography is very much like training wheels for my eyes. When you have a camera and you're walking around, you start imagining things from different perspectives, and unusual angles. You start seeing things that you didn't see before. In some sense, the camera is really just kind of a training aid for your eye. And after you've carried around a digital camera for a few years, pretty soon you can leave the camera at home. And now when you walk around the world, you start seeing the world in really interesting ways just because the camera trained you to see it that way. And I think games can kind of do that as well. You can imagine anything, like let's say a city, and you can imagine like, you know, the story in a city, like let's say Batman and Gotham City, it's a whole concept of what a city is. You can imagine playing with little blocks, and that's a different kind of way of thinking about a city. Uh, or just really interesting visuals, you know, very kind of artistic views of cities, or even systemic views. And each one of these captures some little aspect of what a city is. Uh, games, you know, do this again very effectively. Civilization has given me very interesting kind of historical, regional perspectives on cities. Uh, a game like Grim Fandango was a very kind of interesting, dramatic, cultural perspective on uh, urban areas. SimCity, of course, is very systemic. Uh, and something like Grand Theft Auto is very kind of tactile, immersive. You know, I really feel like I'm standing on the streets of Grand of Liberty City. All these, of course, are abstractions of what a real city is. Uh, now, in games, we've also got kind of this concept of genres. You know, we basically have these genres that we populated over time. These are basically kind of peaks that we're uh, fighting over because we know that they make a profit, etc. But obviously, there are a lot more genres that have yet to be discovered. And I think it's really exciting what's happening right now in games is that games are diversifying at this incredible rate. And we're actually discovering all these new, you know, kind of areas of gameplay that we didn't even know existed before, primarily due to the indie game efforts. But I think games even are kind of a smaller subset of a larger thing that I would call play. Which, you know, play is in the process right now culturally of kind of sending tendrils out into our culture and infusing a lot of other experiences that we don't even really think of traditionally as gaming experiences or play experiences. And so gaming really is becoming almost more of a cultural part of our language. Uh, and we start thinking about uh, other aspects, you know, in game terms. When I wake up in the morning, you know, I get my coffee. The first thing I always do is I sit down and play a level of Advance Wars on my DS. And this is just like a habit I've gotten into. And I notice like every now and then I lose my DS or whatever. And I notice that the DS has a much bigger effect at spinning my brain up than the coffee does. Uh, I can live without the coffee every morning. I can't live without my Advance Wars. Uh, and so it's interesting how games are filling all these little interstitial aspects of our lives, you know, kind of minute to minute. Uh, different platforms, et cetera. There's definitely a language. You know, when you talk to somebody, let's say, of a generation that didn't play games, and they're talking about their kids playing games, on the screen they're seeing, you know, you know, murder and mayhem, guns, explosions, whatever. The kid playing the game, you know, is seeing symbols. They're seeing power-ups. They're seeing bonuses. They're seeing this, that, and the other. Um, the kids are actually, you know, speaking in a language and interacting with that game in a language that somebody just observing the screen does not understand. And that's been a big part, I think, of the cultural kind of resistance, you know, as games have kind of entered the larger culture. And, you know, of course, people can always be obsessive about anything. We see this, you know, not just with games, but with almost anything you can imagine. But games obviously do have this very, very powerful ability to grab people in, to kind of capture their attention for, you know, as Rod was pointing out earlier, 500 hours for an MMO. Uh, and this is something that, you know, is a danger and a benefit. Uh, and over 38 years or so that I've kind of been playing games, uh, the evolution has been just dramatic, tremendous compared to any other media form. And I think, so in some sense, we're all a little behind the gun and we're all being kind of surprised by what this uh, medium can offer. I've had a lot of people, you know, since I started uh, working games and started Maxis and then later worked for EA, uh, at different companies coming to us. And it might be, you know, anything from the Canadian National Railway to the Australian Tax Board. Uh, to various commercial, you know, private enterprises, and they always understand that games are really powerful, and they want to somehow get some of that magic, black magic, you know, in their product. And I've, these are all things that people have approached me with, you know, saying that, oh, we sell this product, or we have this service, and we want you to use games to make this more interesting. 
uh, you know, for them, and these are all real things that people have come up and said, somehow games are going to make this more interesting. Uh, for them, it's like this secret sauce that gaming is, you know, interactivity. Although interactivity really is like the natural way we're born into this world. We learn storytelling later. We're born as, you know, young children interacting with it directly and learning from it that way. In the entertainment industry at large, there are these different silos. You know, basically we have the movie industry, all the game industry, of course, television, music. Um, they're thought of quite differently in terms of the way they're created. Uh, academics is very similar. You know, you basically have these departments and they have their own language and their own way of doing things. But really all the interesting science, you know, to me seems to be coming from the interstitial areas, the intersections, the interdisciplinary work between these different academic fields. I think the same thing is really starting to ch happen in the entertainment area. All the really interesting uh, trends in entertainment are coming from the intersections of what used to be very established fields with their own way of doing business. Uh, I think we're kind of entering this era of what I would call interdisciplinary entertainment. Um, we can almost imagine a world in which there are people that just know how to design houses. That's all they ever do. There are a whole different set of people that only design skyscrapers. And a third set that only design factories, but there's no concept of an architect. There's no kind of abstraction of all these different activities into a larger design field. And I think entertainment is really ripe for this to happen right now. People, designers going in as entertainment designers, not as game designers, not as, you know, movie directors or TV producers. Now, as an experiment, I kind of did a very rough thumbnail of the major entertainment areas worldwide. This is just my, my very rough estimates about worldwide value, dollar value of different things uh, worldwide. It's actually kind of interesting if you look, you know, these, I just did a very kind of brief survey of this. And I kind of organized these, you know, roughly with story up at this corner, kind of play, more interactive experiences down here. And this is kind of more miscellaneous in some sense. Um, obviously, there's a lot of kind of fuzziness to the middle here. But it's interesting within this kind of landscape of entertainment, uh, there are flows. Uh, really interesting currents that have a lot to do with the way entertainment's created, the way it's disseminated, you know, how it evolves over time. Um, you can take any one thing, like sports, and you can say it has kind of primary flows. What are the primary secondary medias that sports goes to? And it has secondary flows after that as well. Um, now, what's also interesting is that there are overall currents in here. Something like movies, in fact, is really upstream in this landscape. So even though the dollar value of movies is fairly small compared to some of the other ones, it's so far upstream that it has a huge influence culturally on all these other fields. So this is like one network through which, you know, we're working through as an entertainment designer. You know, these are all the different kind of ways. There are other platforms, other networks that we're actually working through as well. The kind of what we think of as platforms, hardware platforms, are evolving dramatically right now. There's an explosion of these. This network map is changing on an almost monthly basis in terms of how people are consuming their entertainment and on what devices. In some sense, we're actually working on many, many different platforms, we're working on the technology platforms that distribute this entertainment, the uh, actual hardware platforms that we enjoy the entertainment on. Then there's kind of a format uh, network of the different formats in which we package entertainment. Then, of course, the brain networks that this entertainment goes into, and the social networks that after it goes into our brain, it goes back out and has kind of secondary influences. Uh, for instance, you know, basically the invention of television allowed us to transmit moving images to a device which sits in your living room where we actually would send half-hour sitcoms going into your brain and you talk about over the water cooler the next day. But as an entertainment designer, you're actually kind of working across all these different platforms at once, and each one has kind of interesting challenges and opportunities. Also, these things, as I said, are evolving very, very rapidly. It used to be that when you came out with a particular piece of entertainment, it was built basically for one platform. So you made a movie, it was made for a movie theater, it was delivered on a 35 or 70 millimeter uh, movie reel. Over time, then we had the ability to transmit that movie over television. Uh, and then eventually color television, cable, you know, VCRs, DVDs, etc. That same movie can now be enjoyed on just a countless number of different platforms. It's the same movie, um, but the opportunities of experiencing consuming that piece of entertainment have broadened just dramatically over time. Even things that we don't think of as entertainment platforms are evolving into entertainment platforms. Uh, you know, basically these screens are appearing everywhere, and as soon as these screens appear, it's only a little bit later that we start figuring out, hey, this is a great place to, you know, you know, have entertainment on my phone or in my car or whatever. You know, we're just surrounded with these things all over the place. And not just screens, but even things like our appliances, okay, the Roomba, you know, which really by all accounts sucks as a vacuum cleaner, right? <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't work at all. Well, it works a little bit. But um, it's really more of an entertainment device. You know, people dress these things up, they give them names, they become little pets. You know, and it really, it's a toy, it's an entertainment robot for your home that you can tell your friends you bought it to vacuum your floor. <laughs> We've been turning our real pets into toys uh, in entertainment platforms. Uh, this thing in Up, where the dogs were talking, in fact, is an item that actually exists. You can buy it from Japan. You put this collar on your dog and it translates his barks and whatnot into speech. 
uh, and they actually have like the G-rated version and the X-rated version. So <laughs> we are even turning our pets into kind of electronically enabled entertainment platforms. Uh, now, the game industry, I think, as I said before, is going through this amazing diversification. You know, I think it's something like what happened back, you know, five, six hundred million years ago in the Cambrian explosion. That there's this gigantic diversification of games, and as a result, game communities. These are all real existing game communities, and this is a very, very small map. You know, it's probably a lot more at this point. Uh, and to me, that's a very exciting thing, because 15 years ago, uh, everybody was afraid just the opposite would happen. You know, games were turning into $30 million epics that were all geared to 16-year-old boys that wanted to shoot guns. And it was a chicken and egg problem. You know, how do we get more diverse people playing the games? How do we play different types of games, different themes, different uh, genres? And I think that logjam is cleared. Of course, it's incredibly disruptive to the established companies that have been working on kind of business as usual for decades. But um, for me, this is probably the most healthy thing that could be happening to our industry. Uh, you know, as these kind of platforms are exploding, in the marketplace, um, we have to think about not just the technology of the platforms, you know, all these different devices we can play our games on, but I think, again, there are other platforms that are equally important. You know, basically the culture that we're selling a game into is a platform in, of, in and of itself. The psychology of the players, uh, what type of demographics you're dealing with is a platform. So you can imagine each one of these things is a platform that we target a design for, and we can decide how broadly we want to target a game across these platforms. Uh, so for instance, you know, we can decide in, in the demographic side, you know, we've typically targeted, again, males within kind of a certain age range, but now we're getting games, you know, that old people are playing in their retirement homes, we're getting more women playing social games, etc. But as a designer, you can kind of pick any slice through these platforms. I could say, for instance, you know, what if I want to do games for young girls living in Germany uh, that have a PC? And that's a very particular target, you know, it's an intersection of these three platforms, and you would think it's a very small intersection. Uh, in fact, if you go to Germany and look at, you know, what's on the shelf, PC game uh, shelf, you find out that these girls play horse games. Uh, and apparently they buy lots of them, because there are lots and lots of horse games for little girls in Germany. Uh, <laughs> so even one little slice through that is actually, you know, a fairly lucrative market if you can kind of get them into that. So certain kind of slices through that uh, platform space are more lucrative than others. Now, every now and then you get something where you're actually getting somebody trying to inclusively capture large groups. I want to get everybody, you know, all demographics, all cultures, all platforms, and that is doable. Um, and it's very rare though, but occasionally it does happen. Uh, it's actually interesting, after, after Avatar came out, there were all these news articles about how everybody decided Avatar was about them. Uh, and it was all these kind of local areas that were fighting, you know, it was basically obviously a very timeless story because everybody picked it up and said, oh, they based Avatar on us, you know. Um, and that's a really good example of kind of culturally how you go around and make something that has a universal theme and universal appeal. Now, as we go across platforms, across technology platforms, there used to be a big discrepancy, I think, you know, between kind of what you could deliver on one platform versus another. Uh, and that really mitigated, you know, the flows in that larger media map that I was showing you earlier. Um, you know, if we still had that uh, sort of limitation, I think that we wouldn't, <laughs> we wouldn't see the same, you know, kind of cross-media, interdisciplinary entertainment opportunities that we're seeing today. Um, but as it is, you know, we can actually, you know, give something in a game that's very close to a movie, for instance. Uh, and again, demographically, you know, I think that it's great that we're starting to get, you know, parents playing with their kids, older people. Those open just tremendous opportunities for us in all different directions. Because if you look at, like, um, you know, a bookstore, the ones that still exist, uh, or movie aisle, uh, television even, the diversity of programming there is pretty tremendous relative to games. Uh, and games are just now starting to catch up to this. You know, the themes that you find in a bookstore are all over the place uh, relative to games, which typically fell into like sports and military history or Dungeons and Dragons. So I think this is something that is great and is happening very rapidly in games. Games are finally catching up to these other media forms in that sense. As we pull back to the community side a bit, Way before the internet, one of the things I used to do was I loved to go into bookstores or uh, newsstands, and I would look at all the magazines on the shelf, and I would just kind of contemplate that, wow, there are enough people into modified jumping sports trucks to justify a magazine. You know, for me, this is a map of these weird kind of sub-communities. You know, if there was a magazine representing some strange demographic group, they might be into, you know, tying flies for fly fishing or whatever it was. For me, this was an interesting map of communities that existed in, you know, my vicinity. Um, and typically, you know, all media was broadcast. You know, there were newspapers you bought, television, whatever. There was no really peer-to-peer -peer thing of any uh, 
great amount. But then the computer came around. We had the first networks popping up, CompuServe, G, AOL, et cetera. And that, you know, of course, took off, you know, very rapidly. And basically, you know, at some point these things got connected and started this groundswell, which we are all very familiar with. But basically the same technology that used to connect, you know, all this data, you know, to track incoming missiles, uh, almost exactly, or probably, uh, uh, I have more technology in my pocket right now helping me find Starbucks than NORAD had tracking Soviet missiles coming in like 30 years ago. But um, obviously it's just dramatically altering the world in really interesting ways. One of the most interesting ways for me is the fact that we are now joining communities that are not necessarily in our vicinity and that they are much more aligned to our interests no matter how weird or bizarre or niche. Um, we are joining basically these hive minds, and I think of these communities as hive minds, and they behave in very interesting ways, very differently than individuals. But each one of us, in some sense, you can say, you know, what do you do, or what are your interests? And you might describe three or four different websites or web communities that you spend time with. And it might be an MMO game, it might be a news site, it might be some special interest group. But uh, whenever you build a network, and it doesn't really matter what medium you're building the network in, it drives specialization in interesting ways. It was only after the development of basically the nerve cell that multicellular organisms were able to specialize and have all these specialized cells now and come up with specialized functions and become much more elaborate multicellular organisms. But really it was the development of communication infrastructure between these cells that then allowed specializations. The internet's done very much the same thing to human culture. Uh, even back in the Usenet days, the level of communities and the fractal nature of these communities was really kind of astounding compared to what was able to exist before in the physical topological world. Uh, and in some sense right now, these communities are now, you know, actively competing for heads. It's rush week, you know, every day on the internet. Each one of these communities is trying to convince you of its value. Come join us. Spend time here. You know, we're where you want to be. Um, and now we're definitely entering kind of this area of mimetic evolution, uh, where basically brains are the, you know, the commodity, or brains are the uh, limited resource. And you have this gigantic hive mind, you know, basically competing for your mind share. I think about my parents and their generation and their view of the world and their view of their lives and everything. And I remember that they always had a shoebox, you know, full of pictures. And for them, you know, that was kind of like their view of the world in some sense. They didn't really save newspapers. They kept some books and stuff. They had dim recollections of the TV shows they watched. But this was basically their collective memory. If I think back to my great-grandparents and I imagine well, you know, how much data did they create and then, you know, pass on after their death, you know, probably was a few simple, you know, maybe uh, property records or census data. Uh, my grandparents, you know, probably had, you know, a few of them had journals that they kept that actually, you know, were kept by their grandkids. Uh, my uh, parents had a lot of correspondence and photos and stuff. Um, and I would try to imagine every generation back, how much data did they persist into the future? And then I imagine how much data have I personally kind of created uh, so far in my life, and how much am I likely to create before I die? And, you know, I think I'm definitely going to be in the terabyte range before I die in terms of data that I've personally created, you know, email correspondence, pictures I've taken, games I've designed, whatever. Um, to me, this is kind of an interesting viewpoint uh, because in some sense, I think the amount of data that we're all generating in our lifetimes is going through this asymptotic skyrocket. Now, there's another factor here that I think is kind of interesting, which is what's the half-life of that data? Uh, over what period of time is half that data being lost? And I think, you know, that data was being lost pretty rapidly, you know, back in my great-great-grandparents' day. You know, records were all on paper, they would get lost, a library would burn down, whatever. Um, and I think the half-life of the data is getting longer and longer as well. Uh, in some sense, we're all leaving behind in our lives this huge digital wake of information that somebody can probably reconstruct a lot of our lives from in interesting ways. This basically used to add up to just separate islands of information where your data was just spread out all over the net or in a shoebox or on a thumb drive or on backup CDs. But um, you know, nowadays, basically, as the cloud appears, all these separate islands are being brought together. And this is the world in which, you know, I just had a son recently, and he's you know, basically being born into Skynet. Uh, you know, he's going to be a wash in data, and almost every record of his life, you know, photos, things he's written, you know, whatever, is going to be recorded somewhere and probably persist very far into the future. This has really interesting repercussions, actually. Uh, when we think about the amount of data, even in the terabyte range, the non-digital content of the Library of Congress is actually only about 20 terabytes. Uh, and sometime later this year, you're actually going to be able to buy a one terabyte thumb drive, which means that you can store basically the Library of Congress as it used to be in your pocket which is really just kind of astounding. So data is basically free and storage is free. We're seeing that, you know, in terms of the creations that people do, the amount of data that they're creating, you know, in a game like Spore, within a few months they've created 100 million creatures, which really surprised us. It totally blew us away. There are only 5 million known species on Earth, by the way. Um, and this is something that they were just doing recreationally in a very short period of time. 
Uh, we're about to also have these other technologies. As just one example, this, how many of you have heard of the idea of smart dust? Uh, this is the idea of very, very tiny, little, cheap, almost potentially microscopic sensors that you can deploy over an area. The military like wants to throw them out of, out of an airplane. They would just kind of fall down onto the ground. They actually build a wireless grid between themselves. They can act in concert with each other, actually form a satellite antenna. But they can also act as localized sensors, and they can be sensing whatever you want, audio, uh, thermal, you know, vibration, etc. But now you get basically a limited amount of data over a wide area very, very cheaply. Um, one of the things that you potentially could do with these things is you could actually put a DNA sensor on them, which they have now as well, for a particular person. So if you were looking for a bin Laden, you drop these over a large area, and that person is actually going to leave a DNA trail that they can follow basically uphill and target a person. So this is the type of technologies that are going to be part of our world very, very soon, within the next 10 years, certainly. Um, and the amount of data that these things will be creating is just unbelievable, to where at any point in time, if you want to know what the wind currents are over this particular spot on this particular island in the Pacific, you can get it in real time. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> y'all were warned about this. You were warned. Okay, now, what do Adolf Hitler, Walt Disney, and John F. Kennedy all have in common? Answer? <laughs> that was a good answer. They were all, at different points in history, very strong patrons and fans of this guy, Werner von Braun. Um, so actually, I fooled you. It's not the Russian Space Minute. It's the German Space Minute. <laughs> Although that R7, the uh, Russian R7 there, was a direct descendant of the uh, German V2 and never would have made orbit without the V2 as a predecessor. At any rate, Ron Braun, uh, back in the 30s, was a young man, got very inspired by the work of an American, Robert Goddard who developed the first liquid fuel rocket uh, and just kind of dedicated his whole life to rocketry after that. Um, he ended up actually joining the Nazi party just for the opportunity in the army of working on the German uh, rocket program. And they gave him lots of resources and he developed his own little uh, kind of unit where he was building these things, you know, for the war effort, but for him really the passion was ro rocketry. Now Robert Goddard, uh, who worked in rocketry for many years as well, many decades, um, the largest liquid fuel rocket he ever built was about that big, it's, you know, something you fit on a table. Uh, about 10 years after his pioneering work on these rockets, um, Von Braun had actually developed the V2 rocket, which was a whole different thing. It was an amazing piece of technology really for the time in which it was developed. Uh, in some sense it was like 10 years ahead of its time. And all the basic foundations of modern rocketry were based upon this one thing. Uh, Hitler saw early films of the very first, you know, launches of the V2, and he went apeshit. He loved this thing. Um, you know, he wasn't a very practical guy, but he had a great sense of theatrics, you know, and he just, you know, in his mind imagined millions of these raining down on the Allies, and, you know, this is the weapon that would win the war for him. Therefore, uh, Von Braun became kind of his, you know, child star in some sense. He was a very young engineer. And so Hitler gave him kind of whatever he wanted to and said, yes, we will rain destruction down on the English. Um, I set up several factories. The biggest factory was Mittelbau, uh, which was actually kind of a slave factory, and there were a lot of atrocities committed here. And there was a lot of kind of gray area about how much Von Braun knew what was going on in this factory or not. That was whitewashed, actually, by the U.S. government later on. But um, they ended up building about 3,000, they actually launched about 3,000 V2s during the war, which killed about 7,000 people, mostly the English. Uh, a little known fact was that uh, those, you know, building those V2s killed 20,000 in the factory. So that means for every person in England that died from one of these rockets, three died back in Germany. Uh, so as a military weapon, this thing was really totally a bust. And in fact, the Germans wasted all sorts of money on this. They could have better spent on something else. But toward the end of the war, the Russians and the Americans were closing in on the Germans. Von Braun basically kind of knew that he was going to be captured by one side or the other. He really wanted to go to the American side. So he gathered up his kind of top 100 engineers, and they, you know, brokered a deal with the Americans. And they showed the Americans where a lot of the kind of hidden V2 sites were, and a lot of the V2s were scurried off to America after the war, as were these 100 Germans. Uh, this is basically the 100 Germans that were brought over under great secrecy at first, and they were settled in the suburbs of Alabama. And they started working for the U.S. Army immediately. Um, they all eventually became U.S. citizens. 
Uh, around this time, in the mid-50s, Walt Disney, you know, who was totally into the future and all that, was totally getting into space as well. And at some point he met Von Braun, as Von Braun was working with the army under the rockets. And he was totally entranced by Von Braun, who was a very charismatic guy. And they hit it off right off the bat. And together, ended up producing three short films about the future in space. And these were very prophetic films, you know, kind of showing about how things like docking maneuvers would work, how we build space colonies, how we might travel to Mars. Uh, a lot of these concepts became basically the keystone concepts for other later works of fiction, like 2001. But um, basically, it was a blueprint for the stars that Von Braun had had in his head all along. And you know, one of the basic things in this was a very large multi-stage liquid fuel rocket. Uh, and this rocket, in fact, originally he designed for the Nazis to bomb New York. And Around this time, the Sputnik went up. The Russians launched the first artificial satellite. And the Americans were totally unprepared for this. They kind of thought, OK, we're going to launch a satellite one day. They didn't really think it was such a big deal. They, nobody realized the media impact this would have on the world, psyche, that the Russians did something before the US, especially since it was just a little ball orbiting the Earth. But after Sputnik launched, there was this panic that the Russians are ahead of us in the space race. And at the time, the Navy was running the US space program, the Vanguard, was supposed to be our first satellite into orbit. And uh, it had this kind of dismaying propensity to blow up on the launch pad over and over again. They never got it up. And uh, Von Braun, who was working for the Army, the whole time was raising his hand, I can do it, I can do it, you know, we're ready to go, we're giving six weeks notice. Finally, after so many failures on the Vanguard project, they finally gave the Army program, which was basically Von Braun's group, the go-ahead. Um, they formed the Marshall Space Flight Center as well, and Von Braun became the very first director. And basically, on the very first try, his little rocket, the Explorer 1, became the first artificial US satellite in orbit uh, sometime after the Russians. And from that point on, people basically trusted Von Braun, because these guys had been building large, very large liquid fuel rockets you know, for decades at this point. And so in some sense, Von Braun was always the guy that they had to kind of run every plan past. Is this the way we're going to do it? Um, this is the point at which uh, Kennedy met Von Braun and started developing his own ideas for a very ambitious way to show the Soviets up in space. And, you know, he talked to the engineers and Von Braun and they said, okay, the Russians can beat us here and here, but they can't beat us to the moon and we think we can get the moon, which is really Von Braun's target all along. And again, you know, basically his evolution of the V2 that he designed for the Germans, that was really designed to go from Germany to New York City, uh, became the basic blueprint for the Saturn V that brought us to the moon. And probably got us there 10 years earlier than we would have gone without Von Braun being involved. So that was our Von Braun moment. So back to games. <laughs> So we've talked about the personal kind of shell of experience that we have. Now I think of games as being very immersive things, things that we just want to basically dive into and kind of uh, envelop us. Uh, we've had this idea for a while of virtual reality as well. It's very immersive, you know, let's basically go live in this virtual kind of thing. On the idea that basically reality sucks, right? Um, <laughs> that we want to escape from it. Uh, the games are going to protect us from big bad reality. Uh, the Star Trek, of course, had this concept, you know, very elegantly, uh, the idea of the holodeck. You can go into this room and you can recreate any environment you want to, which is kind of a very sexy idea. Uh, Star Trek, of course, had very many other kind of interesting concepts, many of which are coming true much sooner uh, than you would have thought. Uh, the cell phones that we all carry in our pockets, of course, uh, beam weapons are still a little ways off. But for me, actually, the most fascinating kind of device in Star Trek was always the tricorder. Uh, to me, that was the one I always wanted. You know, basically this thing that would scan the world around me and tell me more about the world around me than, you know, distract me from it. And I even had like a little toy model of this when I was a kid. Um, but of course, you know, I basically feel like I have the tricorder and more in my pocket right now, which is just, I love it. This is like my favorite little device because I've always wanted a tricorder and now I have one. And I'm not the only one with one. You know, everybody out there has one as well, which makes the utility value of this thing tremendous, you know, compared to me being the only one that has a tricorder. Uh, in some sense, you know, of course, these things are bringing together several different networks. You know, we have, you know, of course, the large data clouds that are being developed around us as we speak. Um, can we get it? communication networks that can reach us almost anywhere, plus the raw processing power that we have in these devices is so far beyond the first computers that do games on, it's almost ridiculous. And I think we're getting to the point where these things can actually start, and they are starting to build a very uh, interesting uh, vision of our personal state that they can maintain over time. There's a proximity value of course, to data and information. Uh, sometimes that proximity is in space. You know, If there's something near you, sometimes you want to know about it. It's very important. Other times it's proximity in time. Or maybe social proximity. What are my friends doing? Where are they? Or conceptual proximity. Each one of these is kind of a value point. That as they get closer and closer to me, uh, they have more and more value. 
And what I would call this is basically kind of a situational awareness. We kind of collapse all this into. Situational awareness is really a military term that um, sometimes you don't have a full you know, awareness of what's going on around you. And it is very valuable to have that awareness. But uh, in submarine commanders, actually, are trained in this because submarine commanders are actually getting little readings about the depth and pings and bearings and whatnot. And in their mind, they're actually building a three dimensional representation of what's going on around them. And you know, that's very much an acquired skill set. Of course, in our environments as we walk around, we have a lot of bookmarks out there in signs and symbols and semantics. Uh, and in some sense, they are designed to give us some situational awareness of where the restaurants, where's the stop sign, uh, look out at this crossing. And of course, these things, even in the external physical environment, are starting to target us. They're starting to realize you know, who's walking by and directing ads straight at us. But it reminds me, there was a, about Three months ago, I was down in Burbank, or actually North Hollywood, and I was waiting for a meeting down there at some office. I was about an hour early, and I was sitting, sitting on the sidewalk wondering what to do for an hour. And I saw this kind of uh, Bob's Big Boy sign down the street that looked really kind of kitschy and nostalgic. So I decided just to walk down there just for the hell of it. And I got there, and in the parking lot were all these really cool old cars, and some modern sports cars, and all these old guys on lawn chairs sitting around. And I didn't know what was going on. I went up and asked them. They said, oh, yeah, we get here last Friday of every month. We all get together and bring our cool cars. And we just didn't talk about cars. And I'm a big car nut, so I had a great time for the next hour. I would walk around talking to these guys, looking at their cars, et cetera. Um, you know, it occurred to me that you know, it was only because I happened to see that sign and walk down the street that I ever you know, spent that hour that way. Otherwise, I would have been you know, bored sitting over here. There was a situational awareness I was lacking that had I had um, and I think this happens to me all the time. I think it happens, you know, there are situations that surround me all the time or opportunities that I don't even, uh, I'm not aware of, that if I was aware of, my life would be vastly more interesting. And we have the technology to kind of make this happen as well. I think the difference between known possibilities and actual possibilities is probably tremendous for all of us at uh, many instances in our lives like this. You know, right now, I, so in my head, I have my world state. I hold in there, and I have a world, uh, my own physical state, my own mental state, and that kind of adds up in my mind to what I think the possibilities are around me. I think that you know, with the device I have in my pocket, and the cloud, and all the intelligence that's gathering on me, and all the, basically the data of the world, that uh, they both have the ability to build larger descriptions of my state and my in the world state around me, and offer me a much larger set of possibilities. Um, I'm really intrigued with this idea that games are engaging us in the world more than distracting us from the world. Uh, because I think that there are so many aspects of the world that um, if we only knew they existed, these possibilities, places, things to do, uh, we would grab at them. We would just love to do these things. It's really just a data delivery uh, and matching, kind of matchmaking function, that we are now basically have the infrastructure to deliver. Um, of course, you have to be very careful about that. You know, if I'm in the middle of a burning building, I want to be careful that the system isn't, you know, kind of giving me the wrong recommendations at the wrong level. There's definitely a kind of a Maslow's pyramid, you know, aspect to this. That if I'm at the safety level, I want to know an escape route, not which movie I should watch tonight. Um, but I think that, you know, as we build more intelligence into these things, and we can build, you know, fairly elaborate states, you know, user states, of how the user's feeling, where they are, what they did recently, what's on their schedule, uh, et cetera. Uh, we're in the position to deliver stuff like this. You know, I think games are kind of, in some sense, moving out of the symbolic realm and more in the, into the perceptual realm, where they're actually becoming part of our perception directly of the world around us. We're already familiar in ideas like sports, where they're putting the one yard or the goal line synthetically on the screen. You know, at some point, you start forgetting that that's synthetic. And you just believe it's part of the world. In some sense, you know, for your enjoyment of that football game, it is part of that world very effectively. We're even taking the language from games and retroactively applying it to the real world. So when you look at racing coverage now, it basically the visual language for racing coverage on television is borrowed very heavily from video games. And that's now the way we think of a race, you know, when you're watching it on television. Uh, which brings us kind of the idea of what's known as augmented reality or I tend to kind of prefer to think of it as blended realities. Um, part of that's the idea that we can have synthetic senses, you know, and this is kind of the tricorder aspect of having this device in my pocket. Um, you know, Terminator was like kind of the original example, which I always love the fact that Terminator, if you look at the code on the screen during the movie, it was 6502 machine code, which is uh, really cool that you could run that robot with a 6502. <laughs> but, uh, but the idea, well, you know, augmented reality really is the idea that I'll have this awareness that, you know, is coming from large data services of the world around me as I walk around. And I kind of can naturally integrate that, you know, really the kind of ultimate expression of this is that I had, you know, some kind of heads up display and I'm just kind of looking around. Nobody else even knows what I'm seeing data wise. But in some sense, we effectively already have this in our pockets right now. 
Uh, so and I think that's kind of a moot point. One day we can have one of our glasses, maybe, maybe not. But um, we're even seeing this go down to the toy level right now, which is kind of really astounding to me. This is actually advancing faster than I ever would have predicted. Uh, but it gives us the opportunity to have our things come to life in interesting kind of unexpected ways. We can have imaginary play friends that accompany us everywhere and we have deep and meaningful conversations with. Um, you know, we could turn the world into a psychedelic experience or put different overlays or filters on it. But, or, you know, essentially we can all be psychic, you know, in some sense. You know, we were basically entering the realm of having, uh, you know, supernatural powers, you know, through technology. Now, in virtual worlds, you know, we've already had this kind of idea that we can build worlds out of our imagination, instantiate them, you know, for others to see, which used to be a very uh, hard skill set. You used to have to be a very good writer or painter to imagine a world and present it in a way to where other people could see it. Now we have tools, online games, etc., where anybody can do that. And they're going in and they're not just building their imaginary world, but they're building shared imaginary worlds. So they're collectively building these worlds together, which is a whole different thing. Um, but there's still, these are very immersive experiences. Now we're getting to the point where we can start building these imaginary worlds on top of the world itself. We can distribute it in the world and have different filters and things we apply to it. Uh, so we're getting to the point now where we can put any image into the player's brain or any concept. Uh, now the kind of question is, you know, with the technology, what should we put in there? You know, what kind of things are, what are the opportunities for us to kind of use this? Now, if you think about just the visual system for a second, um, light comes in, you know, it actually goes into our photoreceptors, uh, it fires off these little cells. There are these kind of edge detection circuits and different kind of filters that run on these patterns that hit your retina. And your brain, in some sense, takes these patterns and collectively looks for concepts. It's matching these against concepts that it knows about. A tree, a hand, a foot, a car. Um, and conceptually recreates that in your head. And so when you're actually looking at a scene, you're actually not seeing what you think you see. You don't actually see this HD resolution scene in front of you. Uh, you're actually seeing a little bits and pieces, a high res, and your eye is scanning all the time. Your brain is actually filling in the rest very effectively uh, through a very, very complex process that we don't really even understand yet uh, to make you think that you're actually seeing this scene in front of you. Um, now, this is something that, you know, is actually going to be a very important, I think, kind of uh, frontier for us to understand as we start dealing with the perceptual layer and how we're basically gaming that as a platform. Uh, the audio, just as well, I mean, there's certain things that we can discriminate in audio that uh, doesn't matter how we visualize it, we can't. There was actually a thing that the Santa Fe Research Institute did many years ago. They were trying to find a way to visualize the difference between a nuclear test and an earthquake. And they tried hundreds of different visualization techniques and they could not make, uh, really distinguish the two very easily. Uh, then they tried putting them into audio and instantly, almost any person could listen to the two and say, oh yeah, the nuclear test sounds kind of tinny. Um, we have discrimination circuits in our ear. They're totally different kind of computational circuits in our eyes that if we learn to use that correctly, that's a whole another set of opportunities. So auditory displays are something that I think that we haven't even begun to explore. There was a great book that I would recommend called The User Illusion by this guy named Tor something. I can't pronounce that name. Uh, but basically he was uh, doing very specific um, research on the amount of data that comes in through our senses. And he was very roughly estimating that we take about 10 million bits in through our eyes, about 1 million bits through our touch, our skin, etc. And it kind of falls off pretty dramatically. But then he was actually measuring the conscious stream of thought that we all have, you know, when we're actually thinking about things, how much data is actually going through our conscious mind. And it turns out it's, you know, a very, very, very tiny little fraction of the amount of data coming in through our senses. Uh, so one of the really obvious conclusions, and I won't go into the whole book, but they actually went through a lot of different experiments. And, uh, I think Rod actually was kind of referencing this a little bit earlier about do we have free will, similar research, but really our pre-conscious intelligence is probably the vast majority of our intelligence. Um, what we think of as conscious thought, what we think of as, oh yeah, I decided to do that, is more like, oh, I meant to do that. Uh, when in fact these decisions and the things we you know, think we are consciously deciding are in fact a result of this very complex unconscious process. Um, there's a very elaborate cognitive cycle going on. Robert Minsky wrote a book a long time ago called Society of Mind, where he comes at it from a different angle, but same kind of idea that basically, you know, we are only aware of the conflicts between these lower level agents. And it's when the two, you know, executive vice presidents get into a fight and come to the uh, CEO's office that you even know about it. Otherwise, they're kind of going about business as usual, and that's basically what drives most of your behavior, actually. Um, now, I've noticed this as technology is starting to impact my life. I bought my wife a new car a few months ago. It was a Lexus. And, and I, basically, just for the hell of it, I got all the bells and whistles on it. I got, you know, the uh, heads-up display, the review camera, the parking assistant, the cameras under the mirrors that show you the side when you're doing this and that. And um, I just wanted to kind of see what it was like. And it was interesting. And this 
One of the things I found is that I cannot parallel park with this car. Uh, all these things that were mostly designed to help me parallel park, you know, which for me was a very instinctual, you know, I just never even thought about it. I just, whoop, parallel park. Now I have all these different displays in some sense, and this is just the beginning. Uh, next year's model had these things that would actually have radar cruise control. It would actually have a sensor that would, could tell if I was falling asleep and sound an alarm, uh, or even tell if the driver was distracted by looking the wrong way. And so it was actually getting a much better state of the driver and slowly replacing my instincts. And I think this, this is one of the things that's going to be very interesting is as we start coming up to the human instinctual perceptual level, that we're going to find that a very brittle system. Uh, but yet also at the same time, there are a lot of really interesting opportunities. And I think we're kind of getting to that point now. That's the hard platform that we're having to learn to program. Now, uh, to conclude, just kind of looking ahead into the future a bit, um, you know, where games are going, uh, I think basically they're going everywhere. People ask me, you know, where are games going to be in 10 years? And uh, I think that it's so much more interesting to me now than it was 10 years ago in terms of I think games are going to go everywhere. We're going to have games on every platform we can imagine, for every group we can imagine, on almost every topic we can imagine at some level. Uh, the 38 years that we've seen so far, I think, just kind of got us to this point. But if we look at other art forms and basically the trajectory of their evolution, you know, writing basically evolved initially to keep track of how much rice you had. It was purely for accounting reasons. It was only later that monks, you know, started uh, learning to read and write and write, and, you know, basically religious texts were written. Monks would transcribe these texts, not even to make more copies, really. It was more to venerate the word of God. And monasteries were basically kind of, uh, the wealth of monastery was measured in how many books they had. Uh, but it was only later that I don't think the monks would have seen this coming, you know. So two things made this happen. Uh, you know, first the arrival of the printing press, where these things were easy to duplicate. But more importantly, the development of wide literacy, where a lot of people could actually read books, because back then very few people could even read a book, even if they had one. But um, almost any type of media has gone through this really interesting evolution. What it is nowadays is nothing like the way it started out. You know, what we think of as comic books actually started out as religious plates. They were basically propaganda. Uh, this is a plate showing how while Jesus would watch, you know, his followers' feet, the Pope was demanding that people, you know, bow down to him. And so it was really kind of propaganda against the Catholic Church. Uh, later kind of inscribed. Um, and you can go back to any of these uh, kind of entertainment formats. And even the people that worked in these formats, I think, had no clue what was coming. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, he says, didn't think, and this is him hiding his own invention, that uh, I do not think I'm exaggerating the possibilities of this invention when I tell you that it is my firm belief that one day there will be a telephone in every major town in America. <laughs> now, now this is a guy going out looking for investors, hyping his invention, um, and he's slightly underestimating the potential of this invention. <laughs> The television, you know, when that first came out, people assumed that there would be this renaissance in education, right? Um, you know, and we did get some good educational programs, but mostly we got Dukes of Hazard and stuff like that. But, uh, and this is one of my favorite quotes about television, but um, some of these things haven't necessarily lived up to, up to the potential that we thought they had coming out of the gate. Um, that doesn't mean that they can't, or they might not evolve into something that will. But, uh, and even, you know, basically the computers that we use nowadays that we carry in our pockets really were the evolution of the British bomb, which was developed by Alan Turing to break the Enigma machine. And I'm sure that Alan Turing, you know, in his wildest dreams did not imagine that little boys would be killing simulated Nazis on an evolution of this device. Uh, of course, the internet is like the prime example where it was built for military research and now it's primarily used for trading rare Pokemon cards and downloading porn. Uh, <laughs> So any one of these things, you know, I think games are going to be no exception to this. You know, where they're going to go, uh, you know, these things all have gone from, you know, starting out as very specific problems they were trying to solve. Later, they broadened into very wide entertainment formats uh, where very, you know, diverse set of things were done. But only later after that did they then start aspiring back up to artistic expression. And they became, you know, what we kind of call art, which I tend to think of as a meaningless term. But I'm sure games now have this opportunity. I think we were in danger of being stuck at the bottom uh, level here, but now they are clearly kind of trending back upwards, I think. Now we can think of almost any technology as an extension of the human body. You know, cars extend our legs, uh, television, telescope, our eyes, telephone, our mouth, uh, house, clothing, extends our skin. So almost every human te technology is some amplification of part of our body in some sense. Computers, internet, well, networks, etc., expand all of these things in interesting ways. But I think the most important thing they expand is our imagination in our brain. Uh, you know, in some sense, I think of these as imagination amplifiers. We're now able to construct, you know, these elaborate worlds, play with them, interact with them, talk about them, and also do it with other people. Share these models back and forth. And I think that, you know, for me, this is going to be one of the most uh, 
probably culturally impactful things that our medium can really offer. So that's the end of my talk. And I have time for about four minutes of questions. Thank you.